Uh, so good evening. Um, so my name is uh, Angelica Diggs. So for those of you who I do know or have not met yet, I am the new executive director here at the Montclair History San Center and welcome to our History at Home series. Um, so just a few housekeeping reminders before we get started. Um, if more than one person is viewing tonight, if you could please put that in the chat for us, that helps with our attendance records. And also if you are viewing from more than 20 miles away, we would love to know that as well for our record keeping. Um, all of our History at Home series are free to the public, so there's many ways to support us as an organization. We also are recording tonight's um, presentation. I'll go up on our YouTube channel um, and a number of upcoming other events and programs as well. So I'm just going to put that information in the chat for you to look at this evening. Uh, but for why we are here tonight, so today's History at Home series, um, we are thrilled to host Dr. Christopher Matthews of Montclair State University. So Dr. Matthews will be discussing his new book, A Struggle for Heritage, um, which shares its relevance for inclusive history in communities like that of Montclair. Um, for those who may not know, Dr. Matthews is the chairperson of the anthropology department at Montclair State University, who has written uh, several other books. Um, and also to note that he and his students from Montclair State have conducted many archaeological digs around Montclair, including um, many of which on our grounds related to the Crane House and Clark House on our properties. We even have a new blog post up on our website that highlights the most recent work that Dr. Matthews and his team conducted over the summer months um, before we do some other work on our site. So please check that out as well. So I am gonna turn it over now to Dr. Matthews who's gonna share their screen and we're gonna get started with tonight's presentation. Great, <clears throat> thank you so much, Angelica. And uh, as I said a few minutes ago, welcome back. Thank you. We got to work together on uh, the previous digs earlier yes. in the 2010s. Yes. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I'm going to go through the share screen process, make sure I have this set up right. You guys can tell me if I'm not doing it right. Come on now. You can do it. OK. Looks good. Thank you. Looks good. Thanks so much. Um, so uh, yeah, this is the cover of my recent book, which was published uh, just about two years ago in 2020, uh, and it's great to still be able to talk about it. Uh, and it's a, it's uh, if I can do a better job than this in my future work, I will be impressed even with myself, because this, this has been a wonderful project to be part of, and I'm very happy to share what we've been doing. Uh, the focus of this is a small community in a place called Setauket on the North Shore of Long Island. But I feel that the story that the, this community, researching this community reveals certainly has relevance all around our region. So, um, and uh, at the, in the q and I'm happy to, if people are interested to talk about a new project taking place in Paramus that I'm running, uh, which is a comparable community to this one, which probably produce a, some interesting comparative research down the line. Um, Anyway, I'm here to tell you the story of this community and the story that, that, that I tell in this book. So I'm gonna just advance this forward. <clears throat> this, uh, and I am gonna read some of this. I apologize in advance for that, but it's the details are too hard to keep up in here when I can keep them right here. <laughs> so this mundane document is one of the most important records associated with our region's historic communities of color. It's a deed to a property in Oldfield, New York, a, a small community adjacent to and formerly part of Setauket on the North Shore of Long Island. The deed is for a half acre lot sold by Silas Tobias to Abraham Tobias for $30 in 1823. We know from other sources that Silas and Abraham were people of color and we believe they were related, either brothers or father and son. This document, oops. This document establishes the historic ownership of a plot of land by the Tobias family that contains one of the most important and significant archaeological sites in the area. These remains are what is left of the home these two men, their families and descendants built and lived in for most of the 19th century. The deed is also one of the earliest records identifying people of color in this area as property owners. This evening I will discuss findings from the archaeology at the Tobias site as well as another site that was home to the family of Jacob and Hannah Hart. I will also discuss how this work was part of a larger collaborative preservation effort led by the descendant Native and African American community in Setauket. First, though, I want to discuss the context for understanding this work, both in contemporary and historical perspectives. As you know, 2020 was uh, not our best year. Uh, many, many will remember the pandemic and many others will remember this was the 
the, the year that George Floyd lost his life. And most of us, if not all of us, know the story behind that, uh, so I don't need to repeat it. And if anything good came out of these tragedies, it was a noticeably sharp and I hope sustained rise in the consciousness of the historic struggles of Black and Indigenous people to survive in America. While American history has countless stories of triumph and success, these are partial at best and at worst, totally at, at, at the expense of the vulnerable, vulnerable people hidden by master narratives. Some of my fellow archaeologists have embraced this understanding and have called for a deepened um, commitment to understanding American history from the perspective of Black and Indigenous people whose labor, gifts, and suffering were as much part of any community's success as the already well-documented and excessively praised deeds of our country's great white men. I want to highlight the project I'm working on, the project I'll be speaking about tonight, which began in 2009, was created in a close and ongoing collaboration with the descendant Native and African American community who still live in Setauket. Their direct participation in the project has made this experience personally meaningful for me, but also politically vital, since as I will explain, much of what we have done archaeologically has been driven by an urgency to document and preserve this community's heritage in the face of their erasure. Many people, oh, sorry, this is, this is the folks we're talking about. I'm going to try and put that back up so you can get a better view of them. Ooh, it's very grainy when it's that big. Sorry about that. Many people know historically, uh, Setauket historically is the home of the Culper spy ring during the revolution, the site of a small Revolutionary War skirmish, a 19th century harbor for shipbuilding, and the home of early 20th century rubber factories. Many also know and appreciate the way Setauket has celebrated this history through the Three Village Historical Society and the strong ethos for historic preservation stretching back over 50 years, more than that now. Throughout its existence, though, there has been a community of Native, Amer Native American and African American people who, have witnessed, who lived in the village and witnessed and contributed to the Setauket's community life. While this community history is essential to, well, excuse me, this community's history is essential to understanding Setauket's development, their voice, their history, their stories are not represented in the narratives of the place. One way to understand this and to see their presence is the way they're left out in the work of one of the most regions, one of the region's most important chroniclers, the painter or an artist, William Sidney Mount. I highlight Mount uh, just off the text here because Mount was born in Setauket and grew up in, in neighboring Stony Brook and used the landscape and people of Setauket to make his work, uh, you know, as, a, as the subject of his work almost exclusively. Um, <clears throat> some of you might know this painting, art historians uh, love this painting. Uh, and it obviously has relevance here because of its title, Eagle Spearing in, at Setauket, but also the, the story that it's showing right here of these two uh, interesting and beautifully painted individuals. You might recognize this, it's from 1845. Um, it was commissioned by an attorney in New York City named George Washington Strong, who wanted Mount to paint a work that captured his childhood pleasures from the time he lived at the manor on Strong's neck which is depicted in the background. If you look back behind the trees, there's a manor house and that's the Strong's Manor. Um, the painting and its backstory show that the Strong's grew up with people of color in their family, in their household and in their community. And this woman clearly is representing the family's domestic servant from that time. Yet while we know that the boy is meant to represent George Washington Strong and that he was, uh, and that the model for the painting was a boy named Thomas Judd Strong we know the name of neither the woman who is represented here nor the model who posed for the painting. This kind of missing information is one of the ways that racism works in the making of history and historical narratives, since the silences show that it did not matter to the painter or the patron who this woman really was. I wanna to add to this, uh, this well-known work, a, a less well-known, uh, probably something that very few people know about, a photograph from my birthday party in 1905. This photo shows a group of young people, all members of prominent families in Old Field, which is where that painting was made, enjoying a masquerade party with some of them wearing blackface, as you can see. Names on the back of the photo indicate that the young man in the small hat on the far right of the front row, now if you can see my thing, it's this, this boy here or this young man here, uh, it was the local standout named Ward Melville, who's ho who had hosted the party at his father's home. That's what Red Roof is on the slide, the name of the home. 
The image survives because Ward Melville later rose to local and national prominence through industry and finance. He's known for founding the Tom McCann shoe line, some of you might have heard of, and his family company, the Melville Company, has, is the parent company to something we all know, which is CBS. He was also known for a commitment to historic preservation in his home region and, he, and was the founder of the Three Village Historical Society that I mentioned before. And because of his prominence and service to the community, is now the namesake of the local high school. So if you grew up in Setauket, you go to Ward Melville High School, and I'm just reminding people that Ward Melville was a man who wore blackface. The birthday party in the photo is arguably, arguably, a, excuse me, arguably a product of its time. By the 1880s, many Long Island communities, and I'm sure the same is true in New Jersey, hosted minstrel shows and masquerades based on the dehumanization of Black lives. As an example, the Long Islander reported in a performance in, the, in Huntington, Long Island, in which, the, quote, the plantation song of the Lime Kiln Club was a little head of anything in the minstrel line ever seen in this town, and the audience were fairly convulsed with laughter. The climax came when the bustle dropped from the rear of the dress of the fair African. The address by Julius Collodian, the colored orator, was simply immense. Our popular young fellow townsman, Douglas Conklin, fairly outdid himself. And as so many were unable to gain admission, the entertainment is to, repeated, to be repeated this, this evening. Nice to know that a racist minstrel show was so popular that it had a command performance. Still, while the dehumanization of, uh, of African-Americans through minstrel street has, for the most part, disappeared, the practice of devaluing Black and Indigenous lives continues in the absence of these communities and the historical narratives of our region. Our project has sought to address this problem through a collaboration with the descendant community in Setauket with the intention of amplifying their voices, but also because doing this work is urgent. Specifically, I've worked in partnership with, a, with an organization called Higher Ground Intercultural and Heritage Association on a project called A Long Time Coming. Please note here, just as I say, that we have a Facebook group in case anyone's a Facebook user, which I know is declining rapidly, but perhaps this crowd still uses it. We took, the name of the, we took the name of our project from a well-loved and famous song written by Sam Cooke in the Civil Rights era, the song titled, A Change Is Gonna Come, and A Long Time Coming is one of the main lyrics in that song. The project came together after Higher Ground founded the Bethel Christian Avenue Laurel Hill Historic District in Setauket in 2005 uh, to, provide, to help preserve the historical integrity of their neighborhood. They were prompted to act after a historic house was demolished by a non-local builder who constructed a modern, out-of-character McMansion in its place, right in the heart of what was historically the Black community in Setauket and was and continues to be so. This event signaled to this community that their last foothold in Setauket was no longer secure, but was seemingly set to become part of the long history of displacement of people of color in, from their ancestral home place. Today, there are only 10 families of color living in the historic district, and it's hard to imagine that the community will somehow turn around and people of color will move back. The cost of living in Setauket is high and on the rise, should sound familiar, and this is why people are leaving, should sound familiar, and many resettled and started new lives elsewhere after being forced by circumstance to leave their ancestral village and heritage behind, and we're not sure there's really any way to stem this tide. The urgency I referenced, this is the urgency I referenced above. If we do not act now, the community who constituted the legacy of the people of color who helped to build Setauket and other villages like it, including raising children and like George Washington Strong and Wayne Sydney Mount will be lost. They will not only lose their connection to a home they have known for generations, but doing so now means that we, as witnesses to this erasure, are complicit. The archaeological, archaeological project we designed to make this point clear, I mean, the archaeological project we designed hopes to make this point clear and provide ways to think about solutions. We see this framework for the Long Time Coming project as a counter narrative that both fills in the gaps and silences in the historical record of the region, as well as challenges existing narratives of the place to be more inclusive and self critical. Shown here is the first page of what we created a few years ago, which is something we call a counter map of Setauket. Uh, it was created using Esri's, it's a, a software company, StoryMap platform. 
uh, and it is one result of the work of our project. All of these are historic, uh, either historic or documentary or archaeological images here. Uh, and you can see the buttons across the top with 22 pages of information about the research that we've done. Um, I provided the URL here, and obviously I don't expect you to learn that, but if you search for a counter map of Setauket on Google, you'll find a link which will take you to the ArcGIS page where you can explore this. Um, and because I'd like to spend my, the rest of my time talking about the archaeology, uh, which is embedded in this, but this gives you breadth to the project we've been going on. The site is essentially a multi-stop virtual tour of the Setauket area. Highlighting, highlighting spots in, on the landscape that replace the Native and African American community in the, in the world that they have consistently uh, occupied. And so I welcome you to take some time to poke around the site while I move on to consider what we've learned from the archaeology. So I'll understand if you're trying to do two things at once. I encourage you to do so. One way to engage our counter narrative is with this 1848 deed for a small plot of land to the trustees of the African Methodist Episcopal Society of Setauket and Stony Brook. Three of the founding trustees, as you can see on the right side of the slide, the zoomed up image, were members of the Tobias family, Jacob Tobias, Abraham Tobias, and David Tobias, all who signed their mark, as you can see. Um, the, and we think that Abraham Tobias, who signed this document, also lived at the site we excavated in Oldfield that I mentioned when I started the talk with the, the deed to land there to the Tobias family. <clears throat> Certainly the AME church was important to the lives of this society's members, yet the church was likely more than just a place of worship and refuge. Like other public acts like people, by people of color, establishing AME church, the AME church indicates that the Native and African American community sought to control how they would be understood by outsiders as well as themselves during an important time of social change. In particular, this was a moment when the politics of race changed in New York State as a result of gradual emancipation. And just as an aside, New York beat New Jersey by five years in terms of passing the, the uh, legislation to end slavery in the state. And so this story here is very much comparable to the experience of enslaved and formerly enslaved and the children of enslaved people around this time in our area. At the turn of the 19th century, roughly half the people in the uh, people of color in the, in the town of Brookhaven remained enslaved, and most of those who were free still lived in the homes of their former, former enslavers. By 1850, however, 75% of all people of, of color in the township lived in independent households creating a community that was more robust and visible and distinct. These were the people who established the, this and other AME churches across Long Island. Remember the church was founded in 1848. An act I see is reflecting in their confidence in their own independence. The archeology span at the T Silas Tobias site contributes to this story in the way it documents several strategies the Tobias family developed to establish and maintain their own freedom and autonomy. With archaeology, moreover, we can see how these people practice a life in freedom in ways that we cannot observe by looking at uh, by looking only at documentary sources. I want to start by looking again at the 1823 deed that I shared at the in intro to the talk, which mentions, quote, a dwelling house and lot of land situated on the west side of Conscience Bay, containing by estimation half an acre as the fence now stands. A house, property, and a fenced enclosure established that Silas Tobias owned and occupied a home that anyone could see. It's notable that this is the first known deed for this property since it was already developed by 1823 when Silas was selling it to his relative Abraham, which suggests that Silas was living there without a deed to support his claim. Some have suggested to me, and I probably, and this is probably correct, is that after 1821, men of color had to be property owners in order to, main, in order to have the vote. The only problem with that is this is not enough property to, uh, for, for them to have had the vote, but perhaps that was neither not, not the important part as much as documenting their actual ownership of this plot of land in 1823. Tobias is also documented on the 1800 federal census where he appears as Silas, a Negro, the head of a household consisting of five, quote, other free persons, According to the census, Silas is one of six households consisting of other free persons only, which are, which are considered to be free households of color. There are also 10 other, I mean, there are also 10 enslaved persons and 12 other free persons living in white-headed households listed on the same page, 
suggesting a community, the total of 49 people of color was, uh, was in this area around the Tobias household and would have also amplified and made visible this small uh, enclave of, of people of African and native descent living in this, uh, this part of Setauket. Importantly also archeologically is that because of the 1800 census, because of uh, the fact that they own this, uh, they were occupying a site that was already developed. It, we do, I do think that this map, which is from 1797, indicates the Silas Tobias house. It's this one, obviously there's a large arrow there pointing it out. And what we see is just a little building, but it's right where this Tobias house is located now and, as, and where it's identified in later um, uh, documents. Uh, so it does seem that the Tobias family is, is there before, even before 1800, again, making this a very early and important, uh, because it's early, free household of people of color. Later maps show it, the Tobias house in place consistently from 1837 and 1873, identified as S. Tobias. This would have been the grandson of Silas Tobias, or at least two generations later. Uh, unfortunately, or you know, difficult only for me. It's sometimes hard to know uh, which Tobias is located where. People's names are reused across the generations, but here, S. Tobias refers to someone in, who's identified in the census as Silas Tobias. So we're positive that's him. And in 1896, this is the end of their sequence. There, by then, they're actually no longer living there, and this is a relic of one map copying an earlier map, but in, in nevertheless showing a house by itself on that side. Uh, of the road between Conscience Bay and the road itself. So we're, we know where we're looking at. Um, today, the lot is undeveloped. There's nothing there above the ground. The, 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 uh, the architecture was removed probably around 1900. Uh, and actually, while I'm thinking of it, uh, the reason I found that image of Ward Melville in, black, in blackface is because the house across the street currently owns this property. And that's the house his father uh, built when they came from New York City to build a house out in the country. And they're the ones who actually tore this house down and removed the removed it, whether they removed the family, I don't know, there's no record of it. But nevertheless, this is an interesting convergence of, a, of one history merging with another one site, uh, one family erasing another, which is part of the story I'm trying to tell. So Looking closer at the archaeology, we can see additional information about the Tobias home and daily life, which help us understand their experience and understand how we can reflect on that today. After an initial survey in 2015 of the property, a concentration of historic artifacts in one site, uh, identified a concentration of artifacts in one section of the site, the team excavated 11 test units and recovered over 15,000 artifacts associated with the household. And you can see these are uh, almost all uh, Montclair State uh, University students or uh, volunteers from other universities at the graduate and undergraduate level helping us do this work. Um, uh, and I want to give a shout out to the, 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 the team of people that have, that have made this field work possible. Um, and both, many of which came back and worked with us in the lab at MSU. Um, let me move ahead here. The excavation showed the site to be well organized and preserved and easily understood in terms of where the house stood and how the family used the space around it. I'm not going to dwell too much on how we know these pieces, but architectural features along in EU3, EU6, 10, and 11, as well as partial features in 4 and 7 really showed us this is where the house is, this is where the layout of the house would have been. Uh, and then in, air, in the units that are out behind it, which I call the backyard midden, there's no architectural features there, but there's a lot, a lot of artifacts. This would have been an area of the site where household debris was regularly disposed during, over, basically over the course of the 19th century while the family lived there. Um, pages sticking together. The artifact data table shows that the majority of artifacts, uh, this column here, uh, uh, were from the household and structural category and, and most others related to food ways, such as procurement, preparation, service, and storage, as well as actual food remains. Uh, this is a fairly typical distribution of a household site uh, where household refuse is, is, is scattered across the, the back area uh, and where the house itself no longer stands. If the house stood, there'd be less household and structural remains because they'd still be in the house, but we don't have a house here, so we have most of it left behind in the ground that wasn't you know, taken away to be reused or disposed elsewhere. Um, so this seems like in many ways like a typical 19th century home, but when we look at what we actually have, 
beyond just the numbers, we start to see some interesting patterns of distinction. The first is um, simply that when we are digging in the backyard in that backyard midden, we had really way more shells in the ground than we were normally expecting to find. Uh, you, you know, shells and you, you know, shellfish and that kind of thing is a, a common find in most archaeological sites. I'm, I'm can guarantee that we found uh, clams, maybe oysters at the at the Montclair History Site property, but only a couple here and there. Here we have thousands and thousands of shells, so many that we didn't count them. We just had to weigh them, as you can see in this chart. The majority of these shells were soft shell clam, which is a species that it enjoys or thrives in, uh, let me get the right words here, sandy or muddy bottoms of bays and estuaries. In other words, places just like Conscience Bay. And this is where this picture is taken from this excavation unit. And you can see the, all these little white flecks are the shells amidst this very dark, rich organic deposit. Um, we're you know, 10, 15 yards from the shore of Conscience Bay right here. So this is material that was gathered from the bay, brought into the household, the meat taken out, uh, and, the, and the refuse thrown into the backyard. And so this is the uh, evidence that the Tobias family was regularly exploring, exploiting their own shoreline over the generations they lived there. Um, and that this deposit, which doesn't is not very well stratified internally, but we can sort of we can make a case that it goes through the the length of the 19th century. There's no change in the shells from from the beginning to the end. They're going there every day for a century and making a living out of it, which is really interesting. The archaeofaunal uh, collection. These are bones from animals which have been uh, uh, you know uh, exploited and 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 put with the, the household refuse. Uh, uh, the specialist who looked at these, who is a professor in the anthropology department at NYU, put together this chart and but basically said there's a few things that are really noticeable about this. Uh, it's very diverse, for one thing, lots of different species and with bones from mammal, reptile, bird, and fish species present. Some of them are domestic, uh, though the absence on these uh, specimens of saw marks and the presence of what uh, faunal specialists called the non-meaty parts of the animals, so the ends of the limbs, the skull and the mandible, places where there's not a lot of meat, they're, they're evident in this collection, which tells us that these, uh, the family probably raised and butchered the animals themselves, which isn't that surprising in the 19th century, but it does show that they have that capacity. Bones from deer, snapping turtle, and smaller mammals, including rabbit and possum, reflected trapping and hunting done to supplement their diet, and bird species included uh, uh, both domestic species like chicken as well as wild ones like uh, goose and duck. Um, and you put those all together and you have a large, uh, with a large number of fish bones, which you have in the, in the, in the image on the right there. Um, uh, fish vertebrae along with the water birds and shells, again, shows the regular use of the nearby shoreline for wild food resources, which is uh, basically what you would expect if it was there, but here's the evidence that they were doing it. Next is an important assemblage of unexpected artifacts, which are small uh, lithic or stone tools. We found 440 specimens of these, either the tools themselves or debitage, the broken pieces taken off while the tools were being made or sharpened. And these artifacts are, are, were indeed contemporaneous with the historic Tobias household. That was our biggest question, is this somehow mixed in from an, a pre-contact or prehistoric site? And there's no evidence to suggest any mixing at the site. So it seems that these are Artifacts associated with the Tobias remains, just like the rest of them. They're overwhelmingly quartz, which is a readily available stone material along the shoreline of Long Island Sound. And the majority were produced using a freehand reduction technique, which had been used by native people on Long Island as long as they made stone tools. The collection also includes evidence of tools that were made and when maintained at the site. And you can see here, this is not a local uh, uh, stone material, this is chert. But uh, the specialist who looked at these made a case, makes a case here that it looks like it had been resharpened after it was initially used. He couldn't say for sure if this is a found object that had been resharpened in a long time ago or whether this is something the Tobias did, but he does want to kind of, you know, kind of put it in front of us for us to think about. Uh, and it could very well be that they did not make this tool but found it, but perhaps did sharpen it for use in their, in their own purposes. Of the tools that were found, they had a wide variety of uses, including projectiles like this one, knives, and generalized scraping, cutting, and engraving tools. The tools are the very much the same kinds of tools you would find in a pre-contact site, 
Uh, and thus the specialist who's focused on the sleep free contact materials was very familiar with everything we found. Nothing was surprising in other words. So like the shells and the bones, the tools show the use of a freely available local resource along with the traditional local technology that mirrors the evidence of shoreline food exploitation going back centuries in Long Island. Then uh, a last set of artifacts from the Tobias site rounds out this discussion. These are the remains of two eel spear heads, uh, which were found in locations adjacent to the former house as if they were leaning against it when the house was demolished. Eel spears are long handled wooden shafts. You saw one earlier in the painting set with wrought iron, head, uh, iron heads used to capture and hold slippery eels by pinching their thick skin. Uh, uh, the two images, the two, uh, Artifacts on the right, uh, the, the six-tonged one uh, or tined one and the single tine are artifacts from the site. And as it says on the spear uh, on the slide, the one on the left is an antique collector's item giving you an indication of what one of these looked like if it hadn't been buried in the ground after a house was demolished around it. Uh, and you can see this, the, you know, the clear resemblance and similarity, you know, making it no doubt that these are eel spear, uh, surviving eel spear fragments. So the style of the eels, uh, the style of the eel spears here, we think are like this antique version would have had that central spoon in the, which is missing from the recovered animals, which would help to gather the eel and pinch the skin, but without um, killing the animal, because one of the goals is to keep it alive in order to sell uh, or or or, or um, process live eels, which is something that the historical record said was an important part of this work. Um, Again, eels live in Conscience Bay and other local waters, and that these eel spears, again, yet demonstrate another way that Tobias has exploited their immediate local environment. But as I mentioned, and as you've seen before, eel spears have a resonance in Setauket, which perhaps is more, import more important historically and culturally than, um, than just the presence of that kind of activity in the community. Um, the spearhead in the painting, let me go advance one more, is again, just like the spearhead that we re recovered, the same times, the same, uh, the number of times, it's, it's a very interesting parallel. And given that the setting of the painting, if I can go back to the painting again, here we are, there they are on Conscience Bay, looking east from the same shoreline where the Tobiases lived, is an interesting uh, uh, correlation or parallel as well. So the setting of the painting is Conscience Bay, looking east across the water towards Strong's neck, Mount's vantage point for painting this could very well have been close to the Tobias property. It's also likely uh, that Mount knew the Tobias family since he grew up in the region and employed local people of color as models. Thus, there is a fascinating potential argument to be made that the woman in the painting we're looking at right now and the eel spear she is holding in the painting that we're looking at right now are that eel spear. Who knows? <laughs> but people like it when I say that, so I'm gonna say it every time. The possibility of that seems relatively high and uh, we're excited about that, but I can't say there's anything more than the potential. Uh, just to put some context in it, a house, uh, homeowners who live about a half a mile south of this site have a found an eel spear in their gardening effort. So it could be that there were eel spears all over Conscience Bay and that that's, there's no reason to be absolutely certain that these two uh, eel spears from the, history, the archeological site and the painting are the same, but it's interesting to think about. So in all the archeological evidence from the Tobias site tells a fairly straightforward story of their use of locally available natural resources to support their livelihood. More so the data suggests that they knew and used traditional Native, Native American cultural knowledge to do so, including both lithic technology as well as settling where they did because of the access it afforded to essential shoreline use resources long used by Native Long Islanders. While there's no knowing how the Tobiases identified themselves, whether they saw themselves as Native American or not, it does appear that they embraced an indigenous way of life. But what does it mean though that the Tobias family lived in the 19th century like Native Americans? One perspective is that they represent the survival of indigenous people and cultural traditions despite colonization and displacement, but I, but I do not think this interpretation tells the whole story. After all, at least one member of this household was the founder of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Rather, I think what we see is less the preservation of a Native American culture than the creolization of American lives as communities in the 19th century in our region adjusted to freedom and learned what from those uh, and learned from those that lived around them. 
Certainly, the archaeological data provides evidence that the Tobiases followed a visibly alternative way of life in Setauket, fishing, eel spearing, trapping, hunting, shellfish gathering, and especially collecting and making stone tools would have been out of the ordinary as the 19th century progressed. Such anachronistic practices could have set the Tobiases up for ridicule, but I don't think that it did. The authentic and carefully crafted image of the, of the eel spear portrayed in this painting by Mount, a woman who dominates the scene and towers over the other character, a white boy and his little dog, falls in line with an understanding that the daily life at, at the Tobias household was organized, successful, and framed in large part by their economic autonomy and political freedom. This may be exactly what Mount was trying to express in this painting, and arguably it is also what the community of color was saying to themselves and their white neighbors when they promoted three Tobias men as founding trustees of their new church. In this case, it's not the, it was not their ethnic ancestry that mattered, but their capacity to successfully lead a household of color in the context of an increasingly difficult and racialized society. Switching gears a little to tell you about the other site where we have done research, uh, the archaeology at the Jacob and Hannah Hart site, located in the heart of uh, the Setauket village, tells a slightly different story. The, the Harts lived here, as you can see, from the 1880s to the 1930s, so they overlap with the end of the, uh, the Tobias site, uh, the, when the Tobiases lived at the other site, uh, but, it, but stayed here uh, uh, well past and, and into the early part of the 20th century. To be brief, there are no shells here, very few animal bones, and even fewer lithic tools. The site assemblages, in other words, are very different from one another. Instead, the site itself and the materials recovered paint a picture of a more difficult way of life for the hearts than what we see with the Tobiases. And two particular archaeological findings illustrate. First, there is a thick layer of grit pointed out here, uh, grit and sand overlaying a buried ground surface across most of the site. We determined that there was that we determined that these are likely, excuse me, that the likely source of these soils was the 1938 Long Island Express, oh, I, the Long Island Express hurricane that devastated many parts of the island as well as southern in, in, into New England, including uh, what we now think is evidence of the heart zone being damaged as well. The grit and sand layer suggests the site was buried with flood wash and sediment. In other words, what the, gra the ground surface before the hurricane is below that light colored soil. And that is the, uh, basically the end of the Hart's occupation. You can see some bricks and boards there uh, that were in the ground. And then it was buried by the sediments from a flood. And then above that, at another dark layer, I guess I can use this, this dark layer here, there are no artifacts in there. This site was essentially abandoned after this flood event occurred. So, our, so archaeology suggests that the Hart home was abandoned after this storm, ending a fa the family's 50 plus year residence at the site. Archaeology also shows that the Harts had likely been dealing with groundwater issues well before the hurricane came. Several brick and stone surfaces and pathways, as well as the community memory that there was a well under the house, suggest they needed to mitigate, mitigate groundwater often. Uh, you can see these are very wet uh, excavation pits. They're, this one has standing water. It was, uh, this interpretation comes from having to dig through standing water and pump out water while we were digging because the, the groundwater here is very close to the surface and will pop right up here. And that's just gave us a clue that this must have been a very difficult place to live. Uh, and essentially, there's a, it's near a creek, near a, a mill pond, and a, a mill pond is essentially silted in and uh, this, prop this property essentially became unlivable uh, or almost unlivable before the storm came. And the fact that the storm destroyed it uh, perhaps tells uh, part of that same story. So uh, you add to this the fact that Hannah Hart was a laundress by trade, according to the census, and probably made uh, maintaining a clean or dry or usable outdoor work surface urgent since her livelihood relied on the kind of work areas that could that would keep clothes clean uh, on, on her own property here. And then the second piece I want to point out is this, again, lithic artifact. This is a stone tool found at the heart site uh, with a couple of pieces uh, that have, have, would have been chipped off of it. Um, what's interesting about this is that they show a surprising continuation of a craft tradition that most people had long abandoned by the turn of the 20th century, and here we have evidence of it here, but also because this tool, as the slide says, is not used. There's no evidence that it was ever used. You can see 
pit marks, scratches, uh, you know, wear on tools when they're used like this. And this one looks like it was just made. Uh, obviously, it wasn't just made, but it was something interesting about it having been made and then not used. This means that someone, and perhaps that was Jacob Hart, he was the one, uh, unlike his wife was born in Virginia, but he was born in, um, in Setauket in the 1860s. He is a, uh, a close relative of the Tobiases who lived at the other site um, uh, and uh, is sort of would have been familiar with their way of life, would have known them in the community. And so this means that perhaps someone like Jacob Hart had the knowledge and skill to produce this tool, but had no use for it. There was no reason to put it to any use. So perhaps it was a hobby thing. Perhaps it was an interesting thing to remember how to do. Um, and then as others have suggested, perhaps they just found this, but nevertheless, it was a tool that was made and not used and it's something to think about. So unlike his Tobias ancestors who owned land that could be farmed and had space for domesticated animals and could support, uh, that could supplement their living with gathered resources from the land and the water. Jacob Hart earned his living through wage labor at the local rubber factories and shipyards. And we have the, the documentation to show that. So he lived in a very different context, same kind of person, same family by extension, uh, but at a different time and in, in living in a different place. So the question is what role did this tool play? My, my suspicion is that this is a memento to a community and a way of life that he knew from memory, knew from family, but lost as the world around him changed. There was no need for a stone tool in the early 20th century, but maybe there was a need beyond its being usefulness, but maybe for what it meant. The tool would have been a record for where, of where his people came from, a story that would have been useful and important, though not one they could use in the early 20th century specifically. Instead, I think the tool served as a placeholder in case the opportunity arose for them to find their way back, back to the way of life from before wage labor, before industrialization, and before they lost rights, you know, lost the capacity to live autonomously the way his ancestors did. With the benefit of hindsight, we know now that the world did not change for the hearts and their descendants. The, the world that he uh, maybe was the first generation to enter into is the world we are inheriting and passing along now for the most part. But we should not be surprised that despite their difficulties, this community kept something on hand to guide their sense of self and history in ways that set them apart from what the increasingly racist society around them provided. In other words, they didn't just turn back to something that was autonomous and distinct, but they turned back to the very things that they knew were their own. They knew were the pieces of their own history that they could maintain. And I see, so I see this story, I see the story of this tool leading us back to the points I made earlier about the urgency of projects like this one now. The unused tool found at the heart site speaks to a need to preserve memory or artifacts of the past to help us recognize wh what we are losing and to help us remember how to put things back together if we have the chance. Today, the descendant community in Setauket is fighting against erasure as I've described, but the work we have done together in this project provides a forceful narrative of their survival despite a long struggle for heritage, and perhaps also the means to recuperate what they are losing now if they are given a chance. This is why, uh, and the good fortune we had years ago to choose the name of our project a long time coming, and out of this, uh, you know, this beloved song from this community and, and from uh, African American communities across the country and why this matters to this community. And so I just wanted to put this picture up here to have you think about what it would mean if we could um, see a vision where change could come for these people and see a vision for change that could come while we're here rather uh, than being witnesses to loss, but witnesses to um, survival and recuperation. And that's all I got. Uh, happy to take questions, happy to uh, continue chatting, happy to explain further, and again, like happy to talk about other projects I'm working on. But thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. Um, if anyone would like to ask a question, you can just feel free to unmute, or if you prefer to use the chat, just go right ahead, and I'll give it a moment. I, I had one just um, while we're waiting for a minute there. So the lithic tool that you just, you know, described, which was more maybe as a way to, to speak to memory, mm -hmm. Historically, what would a tool like that have been used at the time for a family who who needed that on a daily purpose? Uh, uh, the 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 specialist who looked at that said it, it, it would have been a scraper, so to scrape hides to, okay. help to break them down. 
Right. Uh, that's his best guess, but without okay. it having been used, he wouldn't know for sure. That's that was what was interesting. He was like, I don't know why this exists. Who who makes a tool and doesn't use it? Right. But I mean, like, I, think- I, I can think about that for a while. So I said, right. I, it's a really interesting concept <laughs> how we all think about memory in different ways, right, mm-hmm. and change. Right. So I, I really I relate to that. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'll be quiet for a moment if anyone else would like to chime in. And I don't think any came in the chat. What is um, your next project, um, Chris, that you have coming up? Would you like to share with the group? Sure. Um, I, I finished those excavations I talked about in 2016. And since then, uh, I've, um, I've reoriented my work to do similar kind of projects in New Jersey. And I've uh, been fortunate enough to come across a site in Paramus, which is called Dunkerhook. Uh, it's an African American community from the 19th century again. And there was one property that wasn't developed, and we excavated there in 2019 and 21. And in 21, it was a field school with the students. Uh, and we have, I don't know, we haven't even had time to count up how many artifacts we found. It's amazing. Um, and so it's mostly from the late 19th century, uh, household materials. Uh, it's very different. Obviously, they're not on a shoreline, no shells. Uh, but it's a it's a it's an interesting uh, project that um, we started talking about uh, in archaeological com- communities, and it's adding to the corpus of information about these uh, marginalized communities in the 19th century. And this one, I think, will have hopefully some interesting things to come out to pair up with to talk it in comparison. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, so one comment did come in was he made tools as a sideline. This one was new and not yet sold. This is from David. Um, it, it looks like more of a, a comment towards that as well. Um, sure. mm-hmm. yeah. well that's a good good suggestion. Uh, it, it very well might be the case, but I think we would have found um, some sort of evidence of tool manufacturing on there. Uh, in the site in from other, you know, where, as we were excavating it, what I showed you, those three pieces were all that we found. And so, it, whereas at the other site where they're making and using tools, they're everywhere. Um, and so if they were doing it, it was either a very small part of his life um, or, um, or we just didn't find it. He did it someplace we didn't have access to. So you might be right. I just don't know for sure. Yeah. Thanks for the, uh, the, the possibility. And I'm, I had one more thought, which I found it very fascinating about, I guess, going back to the Tobias family with that painting and portrait and the possibility of that being connected with the um, the eel spears. I want to make sure I said that correctly. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, have you been in touch with any art historians specifically? Or, I mean, it must be a needle in a haystack to try and identify the people in that painting. People have been looking for who that woman is forever. Um, and... Uh, uh, the, the community in Setauket has an answer. They, they say she's Rachel Holland Hart, and they might be right. Uh, the problem is there is no documentation of anybody named Rachel Holland Hart in Setauket at any point. Sure. Okay. Uh, there are Rachel Hollands. There are Rachel Hart's. Um, Jacob Hart's mother was named Rachel Hart. And so people have said that's his mom. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and right. it's just that we don't know for sure. And so, uh, you know, I don't want to, I'm not saying that they're wrong. I just, as a historian of sorts, I have to be able to document. Uh, okay. And so, I, and I, I say, you know, we could call her Rachel. She probably was Rachel. And maybe we're just not sure who, who her last name was. Right. Um, it's also a very big debate over how old she is. I mean, some right. people think she's 15 and other people think she's 45. So. Right. <laughs> It's a fascinating yeah, it's, it's story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, one more comment to come in. Um, are there any native indigenous communities in Long Island who can give insight into historical relations between people of African descent and the native populations existing today? Uh, yeah. Uh, for one, the community I work with is mixed heritage. Um, they see themselves as native and African uh, and, and embrace that. Um, and but there are members of the community who identify as Settlecott Native American, and they have a powwow every two years in the community. Uh, but they they see themselves as preserving their Indian ancestry and traditions. Uh, but they don't say that we are not African. Um, a lot of communities don't face a struggle with that issue. Uh, because uh, a lot of the identity of being Native American is beyond uh, your claims and your cultural heritage, but it comes attached to 
uh, state and federal recognition and resources that come with that. And if you set yourself up for being not identified as Native American by the powers that be, you might lose those resources. So it's a, it's a tricky one. Uh, however, most, uh, most communities have some recognition that they are not solely Native American. So the, in directly south of Setauket, there's a community known as the Unkachog and uh, on the Puspatuck Reservation. Uh, there's the Shinnecock uh, in Southampton and the Montauket at the far east end in Montauk. All three are Native American communities. The Unkachog and the Shinnecock are, the Unkachog are state recognized. The Shinnecock were recently federally recognized. And one more um, question came in as well. Was there any integration with the community there? Um, what was the community around there? Which, I mean, you just maybe spoke a little bit to that. Um, I'm not sure who asked that, but integration, which community, where do we, can we be more precise? That's from Casarella. If you wanted to add a little more or feel free to unmute if you'd like to as well. Just give it a moment. Can you hear me? Yes. I, I was talking about when the, when the uh, black people first got the land, who were they getting the land from or buying it from? Uh, was, that, was that just from the state? Or from the colony, were there, who were the original settlers there besides the native people? Uh, that's that, that's uh, uh, I, I get that question a lot about the Tobias site. So we don't know who was first. Uh, we, in, in other words, I showed you a deed from 1823. It was a sale of of, a pro, of the property that is the site from Silas to Abraham, but we have no idea how Silas acquired it. Our best guess is that he claimed it. And the people around it said, that's where Silas lives. And they just, there was no reason to have it be legally codified in any way. It was probably, my suspicion is a form of paternalism, like, oh, well, we'll let this, you know, this person of color live here. It's fine. It's not bothering anyone. Let them, you know, set up a home here. Uh, and that's, you know, fine. He'll probably work for us. He'll probably do something else and benefit us. Because the land around it is, is being bought and sold at the same time. Uh, luckily, there's you know really good property records that go well back into the 18th century, and this one lot is identified, and that's the earliest deed. So, as I mentioned in the talk, there's a possibility that they created a deed to legitimize their ownership, and maybe also connected to voting rights at the time. But how they got the land initially, that property, we can't, we haven't been able to answer. Um, and we, we, I mean, he really, Silas Tobias himself is sort of a mystery. We don't know if he's actually local uh, or if he moved into this community from elsewhere. Uh, there is some cross sound uh, movements. There are some people around that same time who are identified as Indian and live in Long Island, but know that they were born in Connecticut is what I mean. They're moving across the sound. So Tobias could have been someone like that, but we don't know. That's, that's, that's one of the unanswered questions. For the Hearts, we know that they acquired the land by purchasing it. Uh, the D, they purchased it from a, uh, it was a subdivision of a, a larger property that they took a little piece of uh, from, and they bought the land from a white landowner. Uh, but it could, my best guess is that Jacob Hart, who I mentioned was born in the 1860s, lived about two lots over. And that lot also kind of has the Tobias feel to it that you don't know how they ended up there. There's uh, and they, they they didn't own that land two lots over. That was they're just identified on a on a historic map as being the residents. Um, so they were how 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 they got to be living there, and that that may be easier to say. They were tenants. They were paying rent, and therefore we don't have a document of their presence except that's except on um, the census and maps. But um, yeah, I, I, maybe I've answered. Um, if yes. I haven't, please feel free to ask for more clarification. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Matthews, where could those who want to purchase your book go to to find it um, to get more information? Uh, all the booksellers you know. It's up there on Amazon. Please uh, please find another route than Amazon. <laughs> if you can, you can buy it from the press, Uni University Press of Florida. Right. And I highly recommend the paperback version. It's actually minorly affordable. The hardback is outrageous. So that's well, not my doing. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Very interesting presentation. So appreciate um, learning more about these communities. So thank you for your time tonight. So I think that's all we had come in for questions. Um, 
Uh, just so for those who are interested, our next History at Home series comes up on October 27th. Um, and this is with Maciel Rodriguez Vars, where we're going to be showing the documentary, Our Schools, Our Town, regarding the Montclair's Magnet School System. Um, so join in for then as well. But thank you so much, Dr. Matthews, for your presentation tonight um, and for set, shedding some light onto those communities and, and how that development has happened. So thank you. Keep, keep us posted on your work in Paramus, too. Yeah, Certainly. that's fascinating. Yeah, I'd be happy to come back and talk about that another time. That'd be great. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Have a great <laughs> night, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye.